Let's rise and sing and praise and worship this morning. Revelation, the first chapter, we read these words. To him who loves and has freed us from our sin by his blood, he has made us to be a kingdom of priests and to serve God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he's coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who have pierced him. All peoples on the earth will mourn because of him. 
so shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is and who is yet to come, the Almighty. Have you come to worship Him? Amen. Let's worship Jesus. I know a place where we can go to lay your troubles down even your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, they can make you wider than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that makes and makes you come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh, we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's be washed by the water, washed by the water, and rise up in amazing grace. Let's go. Dusty roads into paradise. All of my dirt, all of my shame, drowned in the streams that made me born again. And like a tide, it is rising up deep inside a current that moves and makes you come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh, we're going down. The river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Jesus, we thank you that you are living water, Father. And by being with you and being in Christ, we are changed. Father, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that your mercy just washes over us. Over and over and over is your amazing love for us, God. We thank you for your love. We thank you for allowing us to be in your presence, God. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. You have brought me to the water Where my past can be swept away In the current of your mercy And I know I'll never be the same There's no limit to your promise Jesus, you have done it all for me Jesus, you have done it all for me
See? 
Round of applause. Let's exalt him and all we do. He is worthy. Church, you may be seated. Today's reading comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer, nor to devote themselves to myths 
and endless genealogies. These promote controversies rather than God's work, which is by faith. The goal of this command is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have wandered away from these and turned to meaningless walk or talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they are talking about or what they are confidently affirm. Thank you. You may be seated. It's great to be with you this morning and again out of the Word of God. I hope you brought your Bibles and you can follow along with me as we look into 1 Timothy, um, the first chapter. I uh, want to warn you, I know that the doxa is promoting those donuts, and uh, I hope you will support them, but I just want you to know when I, if I just smell them, I gain weight, so you're on your own. But uh, today we want to continue in our series of messages on uh, 1 Timothy. And the reason I want to look at 1 Timothy is because of the call to sound doctrine. Doctrine is a repeated concept throughout the book. And uh, there are a lot of people who say, oh, they want to hear the nice, make me feel good kind of things. But doctrine, solid doctrine is what the church stands on. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that today as we call on promoting sound doctrine. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, what a joy it is to be here and to share together as brothers and sisters your word. Lord, what could a army of 700 people do or more in a community if they would go with the awareness of your word so vital in their lives every day if they were to promote that truth? I pray, Father, that you would be lifted up here today and that we would walk in harmony with the Spirit's leading to promote your truth and your hope of salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus. Guide and direct as we open your truth this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Part of the way the church goes forward, of course, is by people sharing the good news with other people. I like to tell, say it, it's like one beggar telling another beggar where to get a piece of bread. And when we think about what's going on here, Paul has taken under his wing a young Timothy. <clears throat> and as I have been teaching <coughs> 1 Timothy to my, 8, 15, 8, uh, my Tuesday morning group at 10 o'clock and then my early morning Bible study at 6 o'clock with men, I've been challenging them to ask themselves, who's your Timothy? Who are you pouring yourself into to share the gospel with and to help them to be the next generation? We have a great big world around us that needs to hear the truth of Jesus Christ. And the way they will hear the truth is by our testimony. Whether they say we, over, we can overcome the evil one by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Well, Paul had a testimony, and he opens his letter to 1 Timothy in the first two verses that are marked out for us. He reviews, and it's more than just an introduction. It really is a testimony of Paul's life. He tells, first of all, that I have a calling. I am a sent one. I can't emphasize that enough. The church is not called to sit in here and warm pews. The church is here to hear the truth, to go out into a world being sent to proclaim the message. And uh, we have that great opportunity. And Paul had a calling on his life to take the message of Christ to the world and specifically to the Gentile world. He was saved by God. Now, all his life he had invested himself in uh, legalism and Judaism and jumping through all the hoops of Judaism but at this stage in his life, having had a personal encounter with Christ, he says, I am saved by God, by the authority of God. Not only is he saved by God, but he is under God the Father's authority. And this is where it breaks down, folks. We talk about being committed to Christ, but are we really willing in our everyday life 
to come under the authority of Jesus, to bring our lives in submission to the will of Jesus. And then he goes on to say, uh, he proclaimed the grace and mercy and peace of God. He really outlines three essentials of the Christian doctrine, and that is grace, God's unmerited favor, his mercy that, that has, has a, a, a care and love to help us become successful, and then finally that grace, that peace, the, the peace that passes all understanding, the knowledge of God's presence in the midst of every difficulty. So Paul, under the commissioning of Christ with his clear vision of who he is, begins to uh, minister to a young Timothy, and he, by the authority of God, sends Timothy to Ephesus. And uh, make no mistake, it is God's will for Timothy to be in Ephesus. And it is Paul sharing that calling with Timothy through the leadership of God the Father in his own life. In our text, Paul is writing to Timothy, who has been dispatched to the church at Ephesus to oversee the ministry there. And Paul had prophesied years before this that they would come under attack at the church. He warned them and in Acts 20. It says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flocks of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. Be shepherds of the sheep which he brought which he bought with his blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I have never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Paul says here that passionately that there would be attacks upon the church upon the body of believers that would dissuade some of them away from the truth would draw them away and we have to be aware of that that happens in our culture today so he calls him to become aware that false teachers will come now when we talk about false teachers we need to understand that these are people who will water down the word of god they will not teach the whole word in other words, they'll deceptively leave certain things out and they will tell part but not all. This false teaching can become so insidious that it, it creeps in when we don't even expect it. For instance, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this little story. I was, my, some of you uh, may, in this group may not have ever met my mother. She uh, passed away well, about 13 years ago was a godly woman, loved the Lord, served the Lord faithfully all of her life. But I remember one day visiting with her and, uh, in Mount Gilead in, uh, at the old farm, and, and uh, I was sitting at the counter, and she was uh, fixing me coffee. She had fixed me a cup of coffee, and, and she was pushing her pie upon me, you know. <laughs> I had to suffer and eat it. But uh, as I was sitting there, and she was fiddling around there in the kitchen, I, I, I picked up a devotional there, and I began reading it, and I said, what is this, Mom? Oh, she said, that's the most wonderful little booklet. I don't know where that came from, but boy, is it really good. And I flipped it over, and I said, Mom, this is a cult. She said, are you serious? She said, it's so wonderful to read. I said, I know. That's what the devil tries to do. He'll take a lot of things that make you feel good kind of stuff that, uh, and he, he'll tell you all that stuff and get you dissuaded away from truth and you don't even know you're being desensitized. So it can happen. And we need to know that there are those out there, false teachers. He says in 1 Timothy 1, 3, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. First thing I want to point out in that admonition is the word stay there. It'd be really easy to just jump right into these false teachings, and, but the admonition to stay is so important. It's so needful. We need men and women who will engage falsehood and will stay the course. Uh in our Christian school, we're seeking to teach the truth. In our youth group, we're seeking to teach the truth. In our children's ministry, we're seeking to teach the truth. As Pastor Rick has said a, work, uh, a couple weeks ago when he was with us, this word is what we stand on. It's God's truth. 
and we need to stick to it regardless of what anybody else says. We can't water it down. We can't pick and choose what makes us feel good. We have to preach the whole world word. And that's where it goes awry. It's not that these false teachers will teach, won't teach. They just won't teach all of it. They only teach what they want to teach that makes them feel good or builds them up and promotes them. Timothy was not at Ephesus because Paul put him there. It was God who entrusted him with the ministry. Paul in 1 Timothy 1.11 says, For whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine and conforms to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which he entrusted to me, and now it had been entrusted to Timothy. He had given Timothy a special stewardship. The NIV in, uh, may say for it, or stewardship, it, the NIV reads advancing. If you look at verse 4 of our text, or to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Rather than advancing God's work. We have a responsibility to be stewards of God's truth, to be advancing the Word of God, promoting the Word of God. Uh, I was with uh, Chip Minton, I believe this past week at uh, the football field, and uh, he, he is a two-time Olympic bobsledder, uh, power lifter, wrestler, all that kind of stuff. And when we went into the locker room, and you know, the coach gave us a free opportunity to share the gospel, what he did was he punctuated what we've been trying to teach these young men all week long. But this great big athlete comes in with the rings and all the credentials, and he bends the bar around and twists it around, which none of us could do. I, I can do a pike cleaner stem thing but can't do that I can do it with a straw but it doesn't look that good but what he did is in his testimony and by lifting up the word of God he punctuated what we've been trying to say not only this year but throughout the years about the need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ you see we have to be stewards of what God has given us and he could have went in there and told them all kinds of stories about wrestling and about bobsledding and about that but what you got from Chip was he wanted to tell them about Jesus and that's what we've got to be ready to do to tell them about Jesus we have a responsibility to advance the gospel message this is an important role for the church for every Christian to build the church up we must ask ourselves is my attitude, my actions, building or tearing down the church? Is the way I'm living building or tearing down the church? Is it building the kingdom of God? Am I promoting my own personal agendas? Or am I building others up in the kingdom or in the body of believers? A steward has a first responsibility to be faithful to the master. If you remember the unfaithful stewards, you remember when... Uh, the master went away in scripture and he gave one five talents and three talents and then one talent and, and uh, the whole issue is they needed to be faithful to the master and invest what he had but one was afraid of the master and hid it and was not a good steward of what had been given him and I don't know what all God has given you I'm not talking about money I'm talking about abilities I'm talking about an understanding of God's truth are you sharing it openly with others are you being a positive influence for the kingdom? Later in chapter 1, 19 through 20, he talks about having uh, some, he said, some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. What had gone wrong here is these who had been entrusted, and by the way, when you read this passage of scripture it says as I urged you when I went to Macedonia stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies sometimes in scripture you have to pay attention not only to what is being said but you need to have a keen awareness of what is not being said let me give you an illustration of this for instance, you remember the rich young ruler who came to Jesus? Do you remember this in text? And he's so close, and he's telling Jesus his heart, and Jesus says, you do so well, and Jesus, Scripture says he loved him. 
but he says you lack one thing go sell everything you have and what give it to the poor unlike some televangelists and that they say go sell everything you have and give it to me Jesus told him go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and uh, and scripture says that the young man went away sad remember this he went away sad because he had great wealth and he didn't want to give that up what is not said is that Jesus chased it after him he didn't Jesus let him go because the young man had made a decision and that was not to follow Christ now we don't know what happened to the young man we just know this that it says it does not say anything about Jesus chasing after him we have a message that needs to be told others now let me share with you what's not being said in this passage if for instance this problem of false teaching had been within the body itself Paul may have said something in the nature like hey Timothy I need you to go over to uh, to the churches with all the elders get them together and straighten out this false teaching that's going on but that's not what it says matter of fact what he does is leave out that message about the elders which implies that it is the elders that are the problem for instance an elder was to be not only a spiritual leader but a teacher of God's word so those who are teaching are the elders the leaders the presbyteros of the church maybe the pastor so to speak and they're teaching false things and so Timothy is to go there and correct these false teachers who are not just false teachers but are the leaders of the church wow what a responsibility to put on a young man he says that's maybe why paul says don't let anybody look down on your youth but he sends him there to do that and then he talks about as i shared hymenius and alexander later on in the chapter how they had been shipwrecked their faith there were false teachers at ephesus who were trying to make a name for themselves as teachers of the law but who did not know what they were talking about they had turned away from the truth of the word and were listening to fables and myths and endless genealogies raising more questions than they could answer the picture of some teachers today who shy away from the truth their ministries do not build up Christians in the local church but instead foster arguments and division I was a part of a ministerial association in another city one time and as I went to their meetings all they wanted to do was argue about who was doing communion and baptism right every month that's what they talked about finally I wanted to say to them fellas we got a whole community going to hell and we're not doing anything about it we're just sitting around talking about polity and how we do things that isn't what we're about it shouldn't be when we think about ministry we need to understand that that God is calling us to be stewards of God's word and that we cannot allow the message to become watered down or diverted to other things I told the first crowd you know some people say to me well you use too much scripture in your sermons I can't keep up with it well write them down for pity's sakes look them up later but the fact of the matter is I'm going to give you the word of God. I told first service, you didn't get much when you got me as a preacher. I'm not the brightest, not the smartest guy in the world. But what I do know is this word. And this word will keep you safe. So when you go out of here on a Sunday morning, you may not go out with the most modern philosophies. You may not understand politics because of me. But if you go out of there with the word of God, you got something to stand on all week. That's what we're going to talk about. And it's got to be sound doctrine, the truth of God that calls us to a different way of life, the way of Christ. So as we look at this passage, they'd gotten caught up. What they were trying to do is imitate the, the rabbis of that day. The rabbis of that day had gotten into, you know, they, they always talk about their genealogies and where they came from. That was part of the rite of passage for Jewish leaders. And they saw that they taught the law and everybody revered them and respected them. And, and, and what they're trying to do is kind of repeat that. They wanted that, that reverence. They wanted that awe from people. They were trying to build a name for themselves. So they go back into history and pull up some crazy idea about their own genealogy and promote that when they're actually what they were doing is trying to promote themselves rather than the truth of Jesus Christ 
not about the man up here. It's about the truth of God and how we stand on it. Actually, what happens later, they have some connection with, but later on, there would become a group called Gnostics. And Gnostics were people who took a little, and I'm just giving you a real quick synopsis of it. The word Gnostic, we get the word from the word Gnosis, or knowledge. And what they would do is they would look at mysticism, and they would look at uh, Judaism and they would look at Christianity and other religions and they pull from it and say we have this special knowledge come follow us give your soul your money and we'll share you with you this knowledge and you'll have arrived folks I'm going to rub it real blunt here that's what we call world religion when we start combining all these things and that's what the world wants us to do a one world religion pull from over here pull from over there let's put something together we can all live with no jesus said i am the way of the truth and the life no one comes unto the father except through me there cannot be an amalgamation of religions it's only jesus christ and him crucified see there were false teachers trying to make a name for themselves Second Peter says it this way, chapter 2, but there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who brought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not uh, been sleeping. So I want to talk about five things that I think, real quickly here, five truths about false teachers. Number one, they're real. They're real. They're in our midst right now. They want to take away the morality of God's word. They want to take away the authenticity of God's word. They will say out there, these false teachers, well, the Bible was good for then, but we're a lot smarter. We're more educated now. We're more advanced. If this is advanced, folks, I have pity on us. Where we're going as a culture. What we need to know is God's word calls us to a way of life, a holiness, a way that follows in his footsteps. But they will come. They are real, and they will deny the Lord. They will deny the efficacious work of Jesus Christ. They'll say, Jesus was a good teacher. We'll get along with you if you just agree with us. He's a good teacher, and that's it. No, he's not just a good teacher. He is a good teacher, but he is also the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Savior of all mankind. They will bring truth into disrepute. They will say, Oh, that was good for back then. That's not good for right now. They will be motivated by greed. Greed for money. Greed for power and recognition. They will look to prospering themselves at the expense of others. But the fifth thing I want to point out is they will be destroyed there will be an awful accountability. I live with that accountability every day, that if I teach false truths, I will be held accountable. What is it? Woe to the man who does that. It'd be better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the lake than to deceive one of these little ones, God's word says. Jude 18 says, In the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These men who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts and do not live, do not have the Spirit. How will you know these false teachers? Pretty simple. Look for the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. You won't find peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, those fruits in, in Galatians, the sixth, fifth chapter, I believe. But you'll find what is not of a spiritual life, immorality, Dishonesty. Oh, you can go through that whole list there in Galatians, and you're going to recognize them. Greed, all those things are right there. See, 
Second Peter 3.3 3 says, First of all, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Did you catch what was being said here in this admonition? He's saying, they're going to want you to let go of the creator God. But they will deliberately forget that long ago God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed of the water and by the water. They're going to want you to get rid of that. Why is it so essential we maintain the creator God? It's because that same creator God is the one who's able to create a clean heart in you. He's able to give you a new life. That's why we got to have a creator God who created all things, and all things are under his control. By the way, he will destroy it someday and remake it. That's what his promise is. You see, it goes on there. They will scoff and say, where is this coming? I was coming to work one morning, and I, I don't have very far to drive, <laughs> like seven-tenths of a mile. I, I'm here before I know it. And, and, and when I was, had the radio on one morning, and it was one of those radio talk show things, and they were making fun of the second coming of Christ. And I thought, there it is. There it is. Hey, folks, I want to tell you, you ought to be thankful Jesus hasn't come yet. I I'm thankful that he's going to come. I look forward to that moment. Can hardly wait. We used to say, uh, even so, Lord Jesus, come. I'm ready to go today. But here's the truth. God's patient is spelled S-A-L-T-I-O-S-A-L-V-A-T-I-O-N. I better get it right. Salvation. Every moment he waits gives us one more opportunity to get somebody into the kingdom of God. And you can say numbers don't matter. As Pastor Rick has said, it matters to that one. So we have this great opportunity to preach God's salvation. And I want to tell you something. They can laugh and they can joke and they say, where is it? He is coming and it, it might be today. But until then, we've got a job to do to be telling the world around us of the hope we have in Christ Jesus. The word scoffers here means to deride, to mock, treat with scorn, delude, deceive. In the last days, they will basically make fun of God's truth and mock its power. And I don't know if you've been listening to television at all or news, but the comedians are rife with this, making fun of the truth of God. All it takes for false teachers to have success is for those who know the truth to be quiet and say nothing. Teach sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. The word sound means pure, wholesome, helpful doctrine. We are to teach it. The daskala means teaching or instructing. Paul is emphasizing to Timothy the incredible importance of knowing God's word. And folks, as I've said many, many times in here, you cannot learn God's word by sliding this under your pillow at night. It will not come through osmosis to your brain. The only way you learn God's word is to get up in the morning. When Chip Minton was in my Bible study on Thursday morning, I purposely asked him some very pointed questions. I said, you disciplined yourself in athletics all these years. How do you discipline yourself now with the word of, for, for your Christian walk? He said, I get up early in the morning and I'm in the word. There's no shortcut. You all are amazed at the longevity and the power of Pastor Rick is when he preached. I can tell you a secret. He was up early every morning in the Word of God. He believed in the Word of God. He stood on the Word of God. He continues to believe on the Word of God. And at 80 some years, he's still proclaiming it. We got a job to do. We need to teach sound doctrine. Paul emphasized to Timothy this incredible importance of God's Word. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 through 14 says, We also thank God continually because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's truth, or God's churches in Judea, where, which are in Christ Jesus. In other words, as we become engrossed in the word of God, we become imitators of 
We should be becoming imitators of Christ, more like him. So let me share three things. Believers, number one, must share the word of God. You cannot share it unless you have it. You got to know God's word, and there's no shortcut to that. Get in a Bible study. Get in a small group. Come see me. Let's spend some time in the word of God. Secondly, believers must receive the word as God's word. Not the words of humans, but God's word. This is God's word. We stand on that word. Thirdly, believers must allow God's word to transform them. <coughs> the transformational power of God's word is witnessed in our imitating him, being like Christ. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. In other words, his word is uncovering, dissecting, so that we become more like him. 1, Corinthians, or 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 4 says, If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of the Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. They were told not to devote themselves to endless myths and genealogies. He says these promote controversies rather than the work of God. And this is what's sad about wasting time teaching so much junk out there when we could be teaching the word of God which advances the kingdom. But when we get caught up in these things that false teachers teach, it pulls back the teaching. It thwarts the teaching of God's word. Remember this. You only have so much time to impact the kingdom, have an impact for the kingdom. You only have so much time in your children's lives. Every day for 20-some years, I had the opportunity of investing in my children's lives, the Word of God. I can tell you now that I don't get those opportunities like I used to. I see them once in a while. They are wonderful Christian kids. I love them. They're just powerful in the Word. But I just know that I only had limited time to do that. Now I look at that grandson and think, how can I plant the truth of God in his life? as a godly grandfather you see he calls on us thirdly to demonstrate the goal of sound doctrine which is love the goal of this command which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith the goal of this command is love which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith we must teach what we must teach is a call to love now let me share some verses with you. You may want to write these down. I'll give them to you real slow. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. John 13, 35. All these verses call for us to demonstrate Christ's love. Listen to what it says. Teachers, uh, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, with all your mind. Uh, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. 1 John 4, 7, 8 says, uh, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God, and everyone who loveth is born of God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For what? God is love. How many of you want to be like Jesus? Then you've got to be like his love. You've got to allow his love to impact your life, to fill you, to demonstrate it. By this, men will know that you are my disciples if you what? Love one another. Love, this word agape love, is very different from many forms of love that we as a culture have espoused to. Uh, let me talk about this real quick. I know this is uh, elementary for some of you, but let me share with you. Anyway, there are four basic words from my understanding of in scripture for love we got one we just say love well tell me what you mean by love who are you talking to <laughs> i always joke around if i come home and i found a note on my counter and it says i love you and i think well my mom was here or my my uh, uh she loved me or if i found it and i thought it was Robin, oh robin loves me <laughs> 
If I find it from my daughter, and I think, oh, my daughter loves me. Wasn't that wonderful? You know, that's great. It, it, all three have a different meaning. Well, for instance, in Scripture, we have uh, eros love, which is essential love, but it's really not in Scripture. That's just a form of, that's very self-seeking. There's stergo, or stergo, which is really limited to family. It's like mom and dads and kids and aunts and uncles and that sort of thing. Phileo is what we call brotherly love. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But it's more about being friendship, back and forth. But agape love is totally different. It is a Christ-centered love, a love that has no strings attached. It isn't looking for what it can get, but what it can give. So Paul is saying, as agape, we need to be like Christ. For God, what does it say in John 3, 60? For God so agape the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. Pretty weak. Yeah, life! See, God is calling us to exemplify his love, a sacrificial love that reaches to a lost and dying world. And it means sometimes we've got to love them who are unlovable. We've got to be kind. We've got to be compassionate. We've got to reach out with mercy. See, this love comes from a certain kind of a heart, a pure heart. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are those who have a pure heart. There needs to be a singleness of that vision of the heart. Psalms 86, 11 says, Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. Secondly, it comes from a good conscience. And a good conscience is an inner awareness of the quality of one's own actions and a sense of one's moral actions. A clear conscience. And thirdly, it comes from a sincere faith. A faith that is without hypocrisy. Folks, we got a great job ahead of us. We need to guard our own faith, our own lives, and the ministry of the church as it goes forward. And it's got to go forward on sound doctrine. Let's stand. Father God, we thank you for the privilege of reading your word this morning and studying it and understanding from Paul who had a great calling on his life from you as he dispensed Timothy, dispersed Timothy to Ephesus with a call to straighten out the false doctrines that had crept in like wolves among the sheep. Help us to understand that there are many out there being deluded by false teachings. Help us, Lord, be the ones who will stand up and stand on the truth of God. Not be moved, but be serious. If there's someone here today, Lord God, who's been playing with man's religions, but they have never had a personal relationship with you, I pray that today they would surrender their hearts to you, find your forgiveness and grace and mercy, and start a new life in you. Help us as a church, Lord to hold up your truth. And if there's someone here who does not know you, let them come forward. Let's pray for them, Lord. We want to see them know the hope we have in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, this altar's open. Love to pray with you. Falling on my knees in worship, giving all I am to seek your face. Lord, all I
I'm, uh, it's hard to believe football season for uh, Union Locals just about over with. But I've had a really great privilege this year, um, even in the business. God sent me a Timothy to help me with the team. And he's been going out and talking to junior high and helping with the high school. And when I can't be there, he's given devotions. And I was standing on the sideline uh, yesterday uh, during a game, and he was standing beside me, and he says, Jerry, he said, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been and what a privilege I've had to be able to share Jesus with these young people. And I said, thank you, God, for Timothy. Our question is, who's your Timothy? Who is it that God is going to bring into your life that you're going to be poured into? Because here's what's happening. If we don't pour into them, the world will. And when the world pours into them, it will pull them away from the truth of God. We've got to pour the truth back in. We've got to be the living examples. Who will you be a Timothy to? Who will you be an encouragement of their souls? God only gives us this time. Let's use it wisely. When you enter the beautiful city and the saints around you appear, you're going to want to hear somebody say, it was you who invited me here. Father God, as we leave here today, let's go with the awareness that we are to be promoters, advancers of the truth of God, that we have to be careful to be able to stand up in the midst of all the deception to speak the truth in love. And Lord, let us emphasize that, speaking the truth in love not in a condemnatory way that cuts them off from us, but tells them the hope we have in Jesus. Guide and direct as we seek to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.